Well, good morning, everyone. Yep, that's on. All right, we have uh, a few announcements here. One is, is that right down the road at the uh, Lions Club Pavilion, I got a call on Friday from Father Corber from Holy Name of Jesus, and their chicken barbecue is taking place today from noon until 5, but the chicken barbecue is from 12 until 1, and uh, tickets are $18 at the gate, and that includes the afternoon of music and your chicken barbecue meal, and you can get them right down the road here today. Also, I got an email yesterday from Reverend Cynthia up at the Waitley Congregational Church. Their barbecue is on Labor Day from 12 until 2. Their menu includes chicken, corn, potato, rolls, and brownies. Adults are $12 and children are $5. And walk-ins are welcome on that day of Labor Day. Also, I have a phone number if you'd like to reserve your tickets. So, two chicken barbecues are coming up. Also, um, if anyone would like to offer a floral arrangement to be placed in our sanctuary to sign up for one of our Sunday morning chat and coffees or to let us know about your favorite Sunday hymns, those sign-up sheets are right over there on the side. If anyone would like to purchase gift cards for Stop and Shop for Big Y, Linda is right there. You have an announcement, Linda? Okay. Um, also, Bible study group will meet tomorrow evening from 7 until 8 o'clock. And are there any other announcements from the congregation? Okay, I've seen no announcements. There is a, a change to the program. And our prelude this morning is Dances of Delves by W.C. Thank you, Anthony. So, whoever you are and wherever you are on life's journey, 
I sure hope you know that you are welcome here at Hatfield Congregational Church. Last week, as um, I hope you know, we had Reverend Bob Livingston here uh, with his uh, companion dog, Daisy. And uh, so we, I do want to say my welcome back to Anthony because I wasn't here for his first Sunday back after three weeks off. Anthony goes on vacation. He was telling Sharon and me that um, no rain at all except for when he was in the desert. I go on vacation and it, we, got, we drove out on Friday. The sun is out for the whole drive. We get out to the beach about mid-afternoon on Friday. There's still some sun. Then the heavens opened. All day Saturday rain. All day Sunday rain. All day Monday rain. In hand to God, we drove by the beach in York on our way out of town to come back home on Monday. And after we passed the beach, so our last view of the beach for who knows how long, we stop always at the south side of York Beach at a place called Foster's for our last lobster roll. We sit down outside, the sun comes out. <laughs> so, you know, somebody upstairs has got a very good sense of humor. Uh, so he gets rain in the desert, I get rain constantly at the beach. But we did go to the York Congregational Church, which was a very nice experience. And as we walked in, uh, they greeted us there. And uh, for all of you who are regulars here, if anybody does, especially as uh, you know, September rolls around, you might get a new face or something, make sure to go out of your way to say hello, just to, you know, just to even acknowledge them, because it really makes a big difference when you're the new person there. And so someone gave this uh, little package to Sharon, and I thought this was kind of cute. I just want to share it with you. It says, thanks for popping in. Hope you'll stay and grow in faith with us. And they gave us a bag of popcorn to go along with uh, popping in. And also they have a couple of little pamphlets here. But then they also gave us two testaments, which I thought was kind of cute as well. So we got a couple of candies that are testaments and to go along with our popping in popcorn. So I thought that was kind of cute. Also, I did receive a, um, or the church received a thank you card here. And um, I think I should share this with all of you since it is really for all the church. Um, it's, directed, it's addressed to the deacons and the folks from our church family uh, via the kindness of Amy. And this is from the Wagners. Uh, my husband, Glenn, and I are so very uh, thankful for the gift of the Big Y gift card that Amy had brought over. And she continues, thank you for all of the uh, shows of support and prayers always. The cards you have sent to us are much appreciated. When I am not there with you, I am with you in spirit. Uh, but there is nothing more healing than being in church. The music hugs my soul, Denise Wagner. Um, so thank you to everyone who's been reaching out to uh, Denise and to Glenn. Uh, they've been going through quite a lot. And uh, I know that they would love to be here. Uh, she sang in the choir, from what I understand, and everything. Beautiful voice. Uh, but Glenn's uh, condition, and, and now Denise's, is uh, preventing that. And they so wish that they could be here, but they are with us in spirit. And when I do visit them, they do tell me that they, they watch us on the computer. So, if I could now ask you to uh, turn to your bulletin for our call to worship. Jesus is gracious, merciful, and trustworthy. Let us join our voices in giving him thanks. We are called to faithfulness just as Jesus is faithful. We are a covenant people gathered by Jesus as a people of hope. Come then as wise and faithful people. Come as the beloved community of the redeemed. Praise be to God. Amen. And may we now join together in our unison prayer. God of steadfast love, your works delight our hearts and expand our thoughts. Your grace and mercy draw us together to praise you and to celebrate your wondrous deeds. Dwell among us today and reign within the lives of each one gathered here, helping us to grow in discernment, understanding, and faith. Grant wisdom and courage that we may walk in your ways and help in your work of creation. Let this time of worship inspire us to work at building up your kingdom in all the world, starting from the threshold of this, our church. Amen.
All right, let us join together in singing our opening hymn, Blue Hymnal number 15, Rejoice, You Pure in Heart.
Okay, if I could ask our young people to please come forward. There we go. Okay, guys, I had notes for my little talk with you today and those little delves that we sang about came and they took my little notes from my, my children's sermon. So this should be really interesting. <laughs> All right, so I don't know what you guys are gonna do in Sunday school. I was kind of hoping to pop in because Mrs. Wilson has got you down as cooking. I have no idea in the world. Did you, you took my notes? <laughs> Why did you take my notes? First he gets rain in the desert, now he takes my notes. All right, okay. So you're gonna be talking about cooking. I was struggling, how in the world am I gonna have a children's sermon about cooking? Especially because today's gospel, when you're gonna be doing your cooking stuff, is about Jesus saying, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Um, the earliest people outside of the church, when they heard that Christians were talking about eat my flesh and drink my blood, it wasn't a pretty picture. Um, there are some television shows out, out there right now, aren't there? Um, something about, uh, what are they, zombies or something? You know, all that kind of stuff. And so they actually thought that Christians were doing kind of gross stuff about eat my flesh and drink my blood. And I said, I can't figure out how I'm going to talk about that in any kind of a meaningful way. So I'm taking the cooking and letting you guys talk about that yourself. I'll talk about eat my flesh and drink my blood with the others here. What I want to talk about is the, is the other reading. Be filled with the Spirit as you sing among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts. We went on vacation. And last Saturday night in the center of a gunkwood. You guys ever been up to Maine? You ever been to a gunkwit? You ever been walking downtown to get an ice cream or something and you hear a bunch of people singing because up on this uh, second floor with the windows wide open, there's a piano bar. And at this piano bar, there must have been, you couldn't even move, you were like this. There must have been 200 or more people up there all singing different songs. Songs from Mary Poppins to stuff like modern day stuff that I don't even know, but they are all singing and people out on the streets can hear all of these voices singing. So have you ever been to downtown Agunquit for an ice cream and hear like people singing from up on the second floor? No? All right. Well, if you did, I was one of them. So I was up there singing, sharing, singing. We're all singing. That you can, like I said, you can barely move. And people are having a wonderful, wonderful time singing. And I mean, they're singing anything and everything. And some people are singing well and others like me are singing terrible. But everybody is singing and they're having a great time. And you know that Red Sox song about so great or so, so good? So good. So, you know that song? People down on the street in a gunkwit, when we were singing that upstairs, they were singing it out in the streets because we were so loud. There was a lot of joy with that sound. Um, any of you ever go away to camp? You, do you do camp songs? You have never sang a camp song at camp? Yes, you did. You don't sing camp songs at camp? That's the whole definition of a camp song. You sing it at camp. All right, well, I used to go to camp every summer, and every summer there would be these songs, and a lot of the songs, they just, you would only make sense at camp. They just, they, they were just like funny songs, but when you were out there in the woods around a bonfire singing camp songs, it was just fun. And what Paul is telling this earliest congregation in Ephesus, he was telling them that when you raise your voice to God, and it comes, not, it comes from the community, it comes from the heart, there's a joy there. That's what church has to be. All of those people having such a good time up at that piano bar in a gunkwit. All of those kids sitting around a bonfire out in the middle of the woods singing. That's what church is supposed to be. He says, when you do that, when you sing, it just comes from inside and it comes out and it's beautiful and it's joyful. Too many times people think of church as a place where you come and you endure. You just got to last out the hour and then you can go and have your fun. But the earliest Christians, they found joy in coming together as church. That's something that we got to work on together to try and find joy in church. Raise in our voices, not because we have to, but because we have to, because it's inside of us and we want to let it out. That's what church is all about. 
Church is supposed to make us happy. Church is supposed to make us laugh. Church is supposed to make us smile. All right, so try and, we're going to try and work on that this year, okay, with Sunday school and stuff. And I don't know if we have a confirmation class, I might have a couple of you. We're going to try and work on making church something that we want to do, not something that we have to do. All right, guys, whatever you're doing for cooking, good luck. Have a good time.
Thank you, Anthony. So it's time for joys and celebrations and concerns. And we should start off with thankfulness for the humidity to be gone. Such a gorgeous day. And I want to make sure everybody hears this joy and celebration. At a recent review of my cancer status at Mass General, it indicated I'm no longer, they're no longer seeing anything in my liver or my lung. Now the doctor called this remarkable because I've only had four chemotherapy sessions. The sessions will continue. If it's still the same, the sessions will end at the next review and I will have regular PET scans as he indicated there's a likelihood it could come back. But we're thrilled with the news. We want to thank all you people for your prayers. We believe in the power of prayer. God bless. Thank you. That is always so nice to hear wonderful news like that. That truly is a miracle and we're grateful. Um, I saw Cindy bring these in. And these are too beautiful to sit in the back of the church. So Cindy, we're... Oh, I'm sorry. Turn to there. That? More? There. All right. So we are grateful for the gift of, of those flowers, Cindy. Thank you very much. So going from that wonderful news, wonderful day, beautiful flowers, we have to say a prayer for the thousand plus victims reported this past week uh, by the Pennsylvania Grand Jury and their report of clergy sexual abuse. Uh, we need to pray for them. We need to pray for their families. We need to pray also that Jesus may protect the integrity of his church. Also, prayers for two dear ladies who are struggling with cancer and its treatments, um, Jane and Peg. A prayer of thanksgiving for the good news that Jean has just shared with us. Prayers for Sue Gilman, who is under medical treatment for her cancer. Prayers for Glenn and Denise Wagner. As we heard, they are very grateful for these prayers in their times of need. Also, prayers for the Lamprins um, as they undergo their times of trial that um, they may find uh, help and healing. And are there any other prayers? Yes. Okay. Jerry Remy, is, is, if you don't know, is one of the announcers on Nesson for the Red Sox. Um, and he went all the way up to Toronto, got news about his diagnosis, and had to fly back from Toronto to Boston because of his diagnosis of cancer. I think this is the third recurrence of it, if I'm not mistaken. Ten years he's been dealing with it. So prayers for Jerry Remy. Yes, Teresa. Holy, I, I didn't hear that whole thing. Did you say Ray had triple heart bypass surgery and he just came home Tuesday? Wow, thank God for that. All right. Anything else? Yes, Cindy. So that cancer um, is everywhere. Um, any other prayers? Amy, do you want to, everything going A-OK -okay in the Novak household or? Any other prayers you'd like to offer? Okay. 
So let's also take this opportunity in the midst of our public worship for just a few moments of silence so that we can be with Jesus, Jesus in the privacy of our own thoughts uh, to hear what he needs to say to us and that we can only say to him quietly. Jesus, bread of heaven, drink of eternal life, whose life and sacrifice for all of creation calls forth a daring love of neighbor. You feed and inspire us in all that we do, and especially in these moments when our faith is a priority. Your presence leads us to rejoice and to celebrate all that you make possible. Because we feel your nearness here in worship and also when we serve you, we also know that you are near when we pray to you and that whatever we say to you in our prayers, that they are thought, that they are heard by you. Let us now join together in reciting the prayer that Jesus himself taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we make melody to God in our hearts and with our voices, let our hands also be employed in Christ's service. We offer ourselves and the fruits of our labor so Jesus may bless and multiply the good that may be accomplished through them and also through us. May our offerings at this time be employed for the common good of all of God's people. Mighty Lord, as you know, we come here with many for many reasons. We come here with many burdens. We come here with many hopes. This is a place that gives us peace of mind. This is a place that gives us a fresh start. Because of all of those gifts, Lord, we offer you these, our gifts, so that that ministry may continue in your name, that we may continue to spread your gospel and to do your work in the world. We thank everyone for their donations, and we pray that these may continue the work of Hatfield Congregational Church.
Let us now raise our voices in joyous song, blue hymnal number 544, No, Not One. just a little blind this morning. Um, the scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 5 verses 15 through 20. Be careful then how you live, not as unwise people but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So do not be foolish but understand what the will of the Lord is. Do not get drunk with wine for this is debauchery but be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing and making melody to the Lord in your hearts, giving thanks to God the Father at all times and for everything, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And our gospel today is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 6, verses 51 to 58. And Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. 
The Jewish people then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man, unless you drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood have eternal life, and I'll raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me lives in me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Not like that which your ancestors ate, and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. And Jesus said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. You know, thank God the, the summer's come to an end. These batteries just died. <laughs> yep, so we're going with this. Yep, there we go. So this is dead. The last reader, a doctor, can't see, which is always good to hear. <laughs> so the organist steals my notes for the kids' sermon. No more vacations for me. Look what happens when I come back. So may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. So a few days before we went on our beach vacation up to Maine, and that was before I knew that there would be no sun to worry about. Anyway, I went to my annual exam at the dermatologist. I'm fair-skinned, I used to be redhead, but I'm still fair-skinned, and on top of that, my mother's cancer started with melanoma, and she eventually died of cancer at 75, so once a year, my GP sends me off to be on the safe side. In the small talk that takes place in the exam room, when he's fully dressed, and you're in nothing but your skivvies, and he's got this lighted magnifying glass, and he's looking all over your body, well, in some futile attempt to make this seem a little bit less awkward, the doctor asks how my summer is going. And that's when I told my dermatologist that I'm heading off to the beach for four days. That turned the discussion around immediately. I heard all about the dangers of sun. I got all of the warnings about applying and then reapplying sunscreen. I was told to cover up. And not only with my t-shirt and my baseball cap, I was supposed to go out and buy a broad-brimmed straw hat in something called a long sleeve swim shirt. And if I was dressed on the beach like that, I don't know if you saw the newsletter or not, but if I was dressed like that and I kind of fell asleep, I guarantee there would have been so many pictures from my friends and family spread all over the internet, I would have been a laughing stock if I had to dress like that. So he tells me all of this, and then he finishes by saying, when I go on vacation, the doctor says, when I go on vacation, I go to a mountain stream, and I put my feet in the cool water in the shade. And the last thing that he says to me, after all of the warnings about sunscreen and dressing and the evils of sun and how he just sits in the shade on his vacation, he says, and have a good vacation. As soon as he says that, my immediate response to him is, how in the world can I? He just took any of the fun out of going to the beach that was possible. And sometimes I wonder if people have a similar reaction to church. I wonder if church talk sounds like going to the doctor kind of talk. I know the doctor was giving me good advice. I don't want to die of melanoma. I understand all of that. But I just wanted to go to the beach for just a few days and sit out in the sun with a baseball cap and a t-shirt and sunscreen. I was going to take precautions, but this whole idea of going up to a mountain stream in the shade with my feet in the water, I just wanted to have four days in the sun, which still wasn't going to happen anyway. Can the church be like that? Can church sometimes become so engrossed in its own minutia of its message that people almost have to tune it out because of the real world? I'm careful about the sun, but I still went to the beach for a vacation, even though next year I'm going to go back to that dermatologist. So I care about it, but not to the point where I got to go to a mountain stream and sit in the shade. A lot of people believe in God. A vast majority of Americans believe in God, but a small minority believe in church. Why? Well, let me throw this out for consideration. I was talking with a friend on the phone just this past Tuesday. That was the day the Pennsylvania grand jury released their report about the thousand plus children who were sexually abused in that state alone by priests. 
Now this damages all churches. This doesn't just stop at one denomination. This, is, this casts a long shadow, and it affects all organized religion. Now some of these priests were involved in a criminal conspiracy of sharing their victims with each other, and who were then protected by their bishops. And all of these bishops kept these records under lock and key in files because they thought in some perverted way that this was the best way to continue the work of Jesus. This isn't a once in a while occurrence. You all know the Boston Globe story that broke wide open here in Massachusetts. It's happening all over the world. So this is something institutional. Is this sin possible because the church becomes so engrossed in its own message, in its own importance, that that became the priority? Does that make people tune church out? My friend from Pennsylvania called me because he and his wife were right then watching their local news. A bishop had written a letter that was being read on television by a reporter. In the letter, the bishop was apologizing for everything that the other person had to endure because of this child abuse case. The letter was written to the abuser priest, not to the one who was being abused. Now, shouldn't some kind of practical scruples have set off alarms by this point? It so bothered my friend, who's a good person, who's a religious person, but he's not a saint, he's not a priest, he's not a minister, he's not a bishop. It bothered him enough to get on the phone to call me. Shouldn't a bishop or a priest have been even more scandalized by this? Or were they so engrossed in their own message and their own importance that they simply put it in a locked file? And as bad as that was, what I couldn't believe, and I had to watch it for myself on their local news station on my computer, was that this same bishop, a bishop that I had met a couple of times when I was stationed in Scranton, helped to cover up the fact that one of his priests raped a 17-year-old girl, got her pregnant, and then paid $75,000 in church-donated funds to arrange for her to have an abortion. That one I had to hear for myself. My friend's comment to me on the phone after he and his wife watched this on television was, I don't think Jesus will mind so much if I eat meat on Fridays. You know, he said that tongue in cheek. He said that with a little laugh in his voice. But he was absolutely profound when he said that. That's like, I'm going to go to the beach anyway, even though I know the dangers of melanoma, because you can only go so far. But he had heard all of these things, and everything came into perspective. I can eat meat on Friday because look what's happening. He was tuning out the church's message because the small things that were so important to church, like not eating meat on Fridays during Lent, were completely trivial in comparison to the larger morality that was obvious to anyone with a normal conscience. The church's morality was turned inside out. When this happens in church, church loses its voice, people tune it out, they still love and worship God, but not in church. Jesus was never about institution and rules. You just heard that last song that we sang, that you know this lowly Jesus, this humble Jesus, no, not one. He's the one, he cares about everyone. You know, we're all loved by God because Jesus is a lowly savior. When Paul tried to explain this Jesus to the church that was in Rome, he mentioned all of the commandments, all of the thou shalt not. He listed them. He says, these are the things that you cannot do. But when he was trying to explain Jesus to these brand new Christians who already knew all the thou shalt not because they were basically Jewish Christians, they knew all of that. When he tried to explain Jesus, he simply took all of that and he put it into one sentence. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, all of you probably know that Jesus took the Ten Commandments and combined them into two commandments of love. Paul went one step further, and he took the two commandments of love, and he simply said, love your neighbor. Do this, and you get Jesus. And then in a bit of a mixed metaphor, Jesus continues today with this bread of life imagery that we've been hearing about for a number of weeks, but he takes it even deeper. Keep in mind that love your neighbor. Now think about what Jesus says. The bread that I'll give for the life of the world is my flesh. I'm giving everything I possibly can for you. Those who eat my flesh, those who drink my blood, abide in me and I abide in them. It's not just to take away sins. It's to let God in us abide in each other. 
There's a promised unity in this Christian image. This is an institution speak. This is personal. This is Jesus' flesh and blood. He's got nothing else to give. He doesn't have money. He doesn't have wealth. He doesn't have power. He's only got his body. And he says, I'm giving you my flesh and blood. Anything you want, you've got it because I love you that much. That's why Paul could tell those earliest Christians in Rome, love each other like yourself and you get Jesus. When those earliest Christians heard this remarkable news, that God knew them, that God cared about them, that even his Savior coming to the world said, abide in me and I abide in you, they rejoiced because most people back in that time were simply used by someone. You know, they were either like wives, they were soldiers, they were workers, they were children, you know, whatever, they were taxpayers, they, they were whatever, but it was always what they could do for somebody else. Now Jesus promises that I abide in them and they abide in me, that they matter, that they are as much to him as flesh and blood. This is where Paul's words come into play, the ones that Glenda just read for us a few moments ago. Be filled with the Spirit as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourselves, singing, making melody to the Lord in your hearts. Christianity was suffused with joy. That's what I was trying to tell the children. Christianity is not about obligations. I've got to be there on Sunday or else I'm going to go to hell. You know that's preached in some places. Christianity is not about all the thou shalt not. Christianity is supposed to lift you up. Christianity is supposed to fill you with joy. Christianity is supposed to make us better people because we want to be abiding in Jesus and Jesus in us. Christianity was not about rules. It definitely was not about protecting an institution. Christian faith brought meaning and inspiration and love and even laughter into people's lives. And Jesus was there, and Jesus was the reason, and Jesus was the flesh and the blood behind it all. That has to be the voice of the church. We can't ever forget that people are what God cares most about, even more than institution, even more than rules. If we forget that God loves people, that like he said to the Romans, just love each other and you get Jesus, we are no longer really church. Last Sunday, when Sharon and I were up at church in York, Maine, the pastor mentioned in her sermon that one woman from that rather large congregation of over 500 people, that she lived alone and had told her that the greeting in worship was the only time all week, this elderly woman, woman living all by herself, all week, that that greeting in worship was the only time all week when anyone acknowledged her by name. It was a blessing for her. It was a joy for her to be known for who she was. Not what she did, not what she could give, anything like that, but who she was. It was in church. That has to be the voice and the work of church, that people matter. When institution replaces people, church suffers, people love God, but they don't go to church. Church can talk all it wants, but if it forgets this basic message, well, it makes as much sense as saying enjoy your vacation after listing all of the evils of just taking off for a few days to go to the beach. It just doesn't register. You have to block it out. So this we cannot allow to continue to happen. Instead, we must be like that earliest church that actually celebrated the faith. So may this be who we are, a joy-filled people, a people who want to be here, a people who are just... We're, we're just glad that we can be Christian and that we can share that message, not by preaching about hell and damnation, but by the change that they see in us. May that be who we are, and maybe it even has to be who we are, because otherwise we're no longer church, and that's only possible in Jesus' name, when he gives us his flesh and his blood, everything that he possibly can, so that he abides in us and we in him. In his name we pray. Amen. So our sending hymn is Red Hymnal number 524, Lead Me Lord.
you for coming out on this beautiful Sunday morning uh, to worship with us here at Hatfield Congregational. I know I've mentioned this a few other times on these beautiful days, but as Sharon and I drive in from South Deerfield, uh, there is so much going on. There's a road race uh, running up Mount Sugarloaf this morning as we drove by. They, they sounded the horn and off they ran up Mount Sugarloaf. And uh, I guess some people enjoy that kind of stuff. Um, there's all kinds of people walking and running and riding bikes. There's people just out there enjoying a beautiful day. Uh, but you have chosen to take a little part of that day and spend it here with others and with Jesus. And I know that counts a lot for Jesus, and it also means a lot for each and every one of us. So let us uh, now join together in our benediction response. Love God and walk in the statutes that mark his reign. Let your worship continue throughout this week ahead. Live in awe before God, making the most of the time and talent that he has shared with us. Shun that which is destructive and hold on to that which heals. Let us accept the living bread that came down from heaven so that we may walk with Christ throughout our lives. May we keep covenant with the Savior who will never, ever desert us. May the grace and the mercy of Christ go with us today as we leave this sanctuary to love and to serve the Lord. Amen. Amen.